Before we open our Bibles or anything, let's bow in prayer, committing ourselves, uh, praying for our church family and also committing this time to the Lord. Now, Father, we praise you and thank you as we have entered this new year. We pray, uh, Father, as your children, that we will determine in our hearts to walk with you, to draw closer to you in our relationship with you. Father, that we would be about the things that edify and encourage and build up, not just in us, but in, in all of uh, the church family together. Collectively, Father, corporately, we pray that we would become and grow into the church you'd have us to be that we would uh, be growing, that Christ would be formed in us, Father, to the full measure of his stature, that uh, we would be the people that you've called us to be, ambassadors for Christ, ministers of reconciliation here on this earth. May you uh, create in our hearts, Father, uh, an understanding of the importance of uh, the responsibilities you've given us, and I pray that we would understand that one of our main responsibilities is to preach the gospel to the world around us. I pray that you would give us a great zeal for the lost, that we would uh, not just pass by people, but we would think about whether they are saved or not, whether they're going to spend eternity in hell or they're going to spend eternity in your presence, uh, Father. So. I pray that that would be on our hearts, that you would prepare hearts of those people that you know we're going to cross paths with. And then, Father, give us boldness and move our hearts, Father. May 2021 be a year of great evangelism uh, just from and among in this church family that we would uh, be reaching out to those around us. Father, I pray for our youth. I pray that you would mightily undertake on behalf of our young people that they would realize uh, that they too can be conformed to the image of Christ. They too can be ambassadors and ministers of reconciliation. And uh, Father, you desire to use them to serve you in this way. And uh, I pray that you would protect our youth from the defilement of the world around them, protect them in purity and protect them in truth, uh, Father. And may we, uh, older folks, may we reach out to our young people. May we uh, let them know that we love them and we care about them and we care that they grow and they become the leaders of the next generation ready to step into the shoes of someone who's uh, stepping out of their shoes, Father as it were. So I pray that this would be the case, the succession of vital areas of ministry that you would be preparing our young people uh, to take these over. And Father, uh, I pray for marriage and family. May moms and dads love each other in a Christ-like manner, serving one another, uh, putting the other above themselves, unconditional forgiveness and love. Uh, Father, all of these things provide for a uh, wonderful marriage and an environment to bring children up in that is not hostile or it is not, uh, or they learn a wrong, pick up wrong things about marriage. Father, I pray that we would be examples before our children uh, in this way and may encourage parents to teach their children to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Teach, uh, remind parents to preach the gospel faithfully as your spirit convicts our young uh, children concerning their need for Jesus Christ and pray that every single one of our children in this church will come to know Jesus Christ as their savior. And Father, we pray for those that have health issues, there's a, a great number of various issues, Father. I pray that you'd mightily work in the bodies and in the hearts of each one of these that are struggling with pain and various uh, health issues, uh, Father. 
And uh, we want to give thanks for Joanna's uh, safe delivery of uh, Daphne and pray that she will be a real blessing uh, to uh, Joanna and uh, Shane. And uh, Father, we, we thank you uh, for that answer uh, to prayer. And Father, we pray that you would continue to minister uh, to the Jean Caspro and the Mitchell family. And Father, giving them, granting them much support. Give us wisdom to reach out to them in a way uh, that is, is good for them. And so, Father, we, we ask for your leading and guiding in this way. We pray for our nation and we confess that we have turned against you in a large way. Uh, Father, I pray that we would humble our hearts before you and be the nation you'd have us to be. I pray for our uh, present president and all of his family that uh, they would all come to know Jesus Christ as their savior. I pray for the president-elect, his family, and the vice president and her family that all of them would come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And all of our congressional leaders, Father, uh, we pray for them. Grant them wisdom to make decisions uh, in accordance with biblical principles and not contrary uh, to that. Father, and we pray for our building. We th give thanks uh, for uh, the savings there that uh, we could be uh, close to um, putting up this uh, final phase, Father, all to your honor and glory. We pray that um, you would mightily move our hearts uh, to give uh, as you have promised to us that you would supply back what we give and you'll not only supply, but you will also multiply what we, the seed that we sow uh, so that we might have an abundance for every good deed as we see needs all around us, Father, not just the building, but uh, the people around us, Father, neighbors, friends. And so, Father, I pray that we would, uh, that you would mightily work in this way, and then when the building is, is finished, we can say, see what God has done. Now, Father, we pray as we open our Bibles uh, to this very vital uh, section in Romans that you would mightily minister. Father, open our eyes, help us to see our needs, uh, protect us from self-deception, Father, which we know is uh, a very uh, evil thing, and, and the deception of sin and the deception of Satan. All of these work together, Father, to sometimes lull us to sleep. I pray that we would be wide awake, uh, vigilant, alert, and that the, today, by the power of your Spirit, you would minister, Father, the truth of Romans 7 in the hearts of every one of us, Father, that would really change our lives and bring honor and glory to you. And so we thank you now that we have your holy word, the entirety of your word is truth, uh, Father, and we pray that we might feast upon it while the food is on the table. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. It's been two Sundays since we've been in Romans, and uh, so I wanted to back up just as far as three weeks ago, Sunday, when we were in Romans, and I wanted to uh, just go over that section so let's read verses 10 through 13 to start with this morning. This, these are the verses we finished with. Paul writes, And the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, just, and good. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin, through the commandment, might become exceedingly sinful. 
in just a quick summary review, uh, because in, regarding what we just read, because Paul was not living under God's grace provisions, the commandments were bringing death to him, not life as God intends. Living under law meant Paul was trying to live the Christian life without the work of God in his life and therefore found himself under the dominion of sin, bringing death. Paul found that the commandment to bring, Paul found the commandment to bring death because sin took the occasion to deceive him and by the commandment killed him, caused death. Paul comes to understand that the law, the commandments, are holy, just, and good. It is sin that is causing spiritual death in him. It is sin that produces death through the commandment so that sin might become exceedingly sinful, so that sin might be seen for what it is. And before we read the verses for today, I want to, 14 is, is a, a launch verse that we're gonna start in today. Launches us into the last half of Romans chapter seven. And I, so I want to give you the big picture this morning as we step into the details, we can see, have the big picture in our mind where Paul is going with this. Paul had a significant struggle with sin at some point in his Christian life, evident by Romans 7. Not that he wanted to live in sin, Rather, he wanted to obey God, but he found himself doing the very things he did not want to do. Has that ever happened to you? You're, I can't even see any smiles. You, what are you, I know why you wore that mask. <laughs> In an effort to understand this struggle, he asked himself or others if the law was the problem, but he answered, certainly not. It's not. The law is not the problem here as to why I'm struggling spiritually or struggling with sin. He realized law was good. It was holy. It was just, and it was spiritual. It is spiritual. He concluded that sin was the problem. Sin used the law to incite and bring death. Further, Paul began to understand something else. He began to understand his flesh was keeping him in bondage to sin, even though he wanted to obey God. And he wanted to do that which was right. Paul realized there was nothing good in his flesh. He therefore could not accomplish the good that he desired to do. He realized he was a wretched man and asked, who will free me from this body of death? He then realized only God through Jesus Christ and could free him. And so the message really on the last half of Romans 7 is really simple. We are no match for our flesh and sinful nature. No matter how well intended we are, even if we desire to serve God just like Paul did, Paul couldn't do it nor can we, even if we're well intended. Only God working through us can deliver us from the bondage of sin. 
God is almighty. Sin and our sinful nature cannot stand up to God when he is at work in our lives. But whether he's at work in your life or not is up to you. And we'll be talking about what is necessary uh, for that. Now let's read uh, verses 14 through 18. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I'm doing, I don't understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. We'll stop our reading there. Now, beginning in verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual. Here, Paul begins, he's further explaining that the law is good and, is a, and it is able to expose the exceeding sinfulness of sin. Because it is spiritual, it's able to expose this exceeding sinfulness. This is the fourth descriptor of law. The law is holy, it's just, it's good, and now we see in verse 14, the law is spiritual, meaning the law can do a spiritual work as designed by God. And quote here from the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, when the law is called spiritual pneumatikos in Romans 7:14 it is characterized thereby as the law of God which comes from the world of God and not from that of man look if you would to verses 22 and 25 where we see the use of the law the phrase law of God Paul says, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. That's his, that's his spiritual part of him. He, he uh, is favorable to the law of God. Verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind the inner part of him. In my mind, I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, I'll add the words, but with the flesh, I serve the law of sin. So you're beginning to see the, the situation develop here in those verses as we jumped, of course, way ahead where he starts to make some conclusions. So the law is not just physical, it's spiritual. It works in our inner man, the spiritual part of us. The law does a spiritual work. Change in a person starts, real change starts in the spiritual part of man, the inner man, and then it moves outward in our behavior and actions once God begins to, to work and work a change in us. The law was designed by God to do a spiritual work. The law was designed to be a tutor, as Paul writes in Galatians 3, 24 and 25, or 
The law was designed by God to teach us something. And he, in, in the context of Galatians 3, it was teaching us that we were to be justified by faith and not by works. So really what the law was teaching was spo- supposed to teach you as Paul is understanding, I can't do this. It has to be my faith in God. God can do this for me. God, I can't be righteous in and of myself with just my works. God has done something for me and by faith I put my trust in him and then I am delivered, I am saved, both in phase one salvation and in phase two. A two salvation. The law has the spiritual ability to reveal to all of mankind God's righteous standards. The law can be understood by all mankind, but only the spiritual man understands that he cannot keep the law but must wholly lean on God for his spirit to produce in us a life through which the law has been fulfilled. As it says in Romans 8, chapter 4, we must wholly lean on the spirit of God to fulfill in us the righteous requirement of the law. So God works in us the fulfillment of the righteous requirement of the law. We could never do that on our own, even though sometimes we think more highly of ourselves than we ought, and we think maybe that we can, and maybe this was part, maybe this was part of Paul's problem. Because as Paul himself said, hey, if any man can be proud about their background and who they are, I can be the Hebrew of Hebrews, and all of his schooling, and all of those things. And maybe that education hindered his Christian life in the beginning. And, and thus he faces this struggle with sin, the very thing that I hate, that's what I do. What's wrong with me? I don't understand. I don't know about you, but when I got saved, I didn't understand these truths in Romans 7, did you? I understood that I was a sinner. I understood that my sin will keep me from God. And I understood that God loves me so much that he gave his only son and that Jesus, that day he was nailed to the cross, that day he, my sin was laid on him. I didn't know this terminology exactly, but you know the basic idea. And I knew that he died for my sin, that I could be forgiven and be with God one day. That's all I knew. And that's probably all I knew for many years because I was only five when I accepted Christ as my Savior. So we can't shake our finger at the Apostle Paul and say, you should have known better. This is where he was at, at some point in his spiritual growth. He wasn't, he he was flesh and blood like you and I are. He had a sinful nature, as we can well see in chapter 7. So it's kind of comforting in one sense to know, hey, the Apostle Paul went through this process of learning all of what Christ had provided for him so you could be free from sin and the bondage of sin. And so if, if you feel as though you are in bondage to sin in your life, this is the chapter you need. This is what we all need. To live out all of the grace blessings God has given us. 
There's so much he's done for us, and sometimes we don't even realize it. It's like we have a treasure chest full of gold and we never open the chest. So I encourage you to really determine in your heart, I want to understand Romans 6, Romans 7, and Romans 8. And by the way, if you have questions, I was thinking about this this week, if you have questions on any aspect of the message or anything in Romans 6, 7, or 8 as you read it, you can text me, you can um, email me, lchapel5 at comcast.net. I would be thrilled to try and answer your questions. All right. It's interesting that Paul had already mentioned uh, this fact that uh, we're in bondage to law, but in, in God we're free. Look back at verse 6. After he talks about being in the flesh, the old position that we were in, in the flesh, now, he says in verse 6, but now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter, meaning serve God under law principles. Uh, all doing it all by myself. God is not part of that picture. When I'm serving under law, God has nothing to do with that. It's all me, and that's a scary thing. Now, the last phrase in 14, Paul says, but I am carnal, sold under sin. The contrast here, this is in contrast to the law being spiritual. The law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. The law is holy, just, good, and spiritual, but I'm carnal. Is Paul saying, if the law is spiritual, holy, just, and good. Why am I carnal, sold under sin? I'm trying my best. I'm trying to keep the law, but I just can't do it. I don't understand. What is wrong? I imagine that's pretty much what he said. Look, what he, look at back in verse 13. Has then what is good, i.e. the law, has it become death to me? The law is holy, just, good, and spiritual in that it shows me the right path to go down. And it says, don't go down this path, the wrong path. So the commandments of God are exceedingly good. So the law is good to show me the right path, but you know what? The law can't take me down that path. The law has no power. The law was not designed to take me down that good path. The law cannot produce righteousness in me. If the law could produce righteousness in me, then why did God send his son Jesus Christ to die? To provide righteousness for us. He is our righteousness. The law cannot produce righteousness. So this is the frustration of trying to live by the law. The law obviously has no power, and man has no power in and of himself to fulfill the law. Look at verse 3 of chapter 8. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through our flesh, God did by sending his own son. I added the word our flesh. So 
The law couldn't do it. So God had to do what? He had to send his own son who accomplished it for us. And here's the point. Not only did he accomplish our salvation by grace, but he now also is going to accomplish our spiritual growth and sanctification also by faith. As we trust his graces, we won't be under the burden and the dominion of sin. We will be free. Romans 6, 6, 6, 7, as Paul writes, that our old man was crucified with Christ and we have been freed to no longer be under the bondage of sin. If you're living under the bondage of sin, then you need to get an alignment. You need to know these truths. To align with these truths, the only thing that's going to set you free. You're not going to try harder, and then all of a sudden, whoa, I'm living the life now because I tried so hard. That's self-deception. Because Paul said in verse 25, oh, verse 24, when he got to the end of his rope, he said, oh, wretched man that I am, who will free me from this body of death? I have tried to free myself, and it doesn't work. So should we be foolish and try the same thing that Paul couldn't do? I think not. So essentially, <clears throat> Paul is saying he is living according to his flesh. I am carnal. I am sold under sin. He is living according to his flesh, and therefore, when you live according to your flesh, you become a slave of sin. And that's no joke. There is a holding power in sin. Because of your sinful nature and your flesh, there is a holding power to keep you in and under sin and doesn't care if, you come, if he lets you up for air. He would that you would maintain spiritual death until the day you die. That you would have no effect for the cross of Jesus Christ. Is that really where you want to live? Is that where I want to live? I don't think anyone in this room wants to live there. Need I say believers can be carnal? They can be sold under sin? They can be enslaved? They can be under the power of sin. Need I say that? I don't think so. I think we know that we can be carnal. But there's also a sense in which we cannot be carnal or we cannot be in the flesh. Look with me in Romans 8, verse 9. But you, Paul writes to the believers, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Paul is talking about there our position. Our position, once the day you accepted Jesus Christ, you went from being in the flesh to being in Christ. You went from the old man to the new creation in Christ, the new creature, the new man. And so there is that sense that we cannot be in the flesh in our position. That can't be our position. We can't lose our salvation and go back to our former life in that positional sense. 
We can experientially. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Look at verse uh, 5 of chapter 7. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. That's all we could do. When we were in our flesh, all we could do is bear fruit to death, even though we might have served in a soup kitchen or worked in several nonprofits. Guess what? We could not produce life, as it were, only death. Believers are no longer in the flesh positionally, but rather are in Christ. A believer's condition experience can be in the flesh, and this is where Paul is at when he says, I am carnal. All right. He says, sold under sin. This is, I just want to point out one thing here. Guess what that verb is, sold. That is in the passive voice. That means the subject receives the action of the verb. He doesn't, even if he doesn't want it, he receives the action of the verb. And here, Paul is receiving being sold under sin. And when I, and when I or you live according to your flesh, then I present myself to sin, and then I'm received being a slave to sin. Sold to sin. In verse 16 of chapter 6, it says, and I won't read it all, whoever you present yourselves to, that's who you will be a slave to, whether it's righteousness or unrighteousness. But let's read verses, 12 through four, uh, verses 11 through 14 in chapter 6 just to remind ourselves and that there is obviously there is an option that you and I have every day. Paul writes, likewise in verse 11, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. You see, He's exhorting these believers, don't go here, but go here. Present your, the instruments of your body. Present the members of your body to righteousness, not to unrighteousness. So we know that is possible. And Warren Wiersbe writes concerning what we were just speaking of, the law cannot transform the old nature. It can only reveal how sinful that old nature is. The believer who tries to live under law will only activate the old nature. He will not eradicate it. That's a very important point because that's what Paul was trying to do. He was trying to live under law he was trying to do it on his own. He didn't understand yet all of the grace, blessings that he had in Christ Jesus. And that's an interesting point. When God saves us, he doesn't snap his finger and we go to instant maturity. I know everything, now all I have to do is apply it. Here, Paul says, I don't understand what's going on. What did he have to do? He had to learn. That's what we're doing here today. This is the importance of assembling 
corporately as the body of Christ, looking together in God's word. This is part of what God intends for our spiritual growth, not all of it. He intends personal study as well, personal meditation and study. Okay, as I said before, verse 14 sets the stage for the rest of the chapter where Paul describes the inner strife in his life, wanting to do right but not being able to do it. Paul understood that the law was good, but what Paul didn't understand was that he did not have the capacity within himself to fulfill the law. because That's what he was trying to do. In and of himself, he was trying to fulfill the law. Thus, he was extremely frustrated and cried out, O wretched man that I am. What a confession. Putting it in different terms, Paul did not understand that he did not have the capacity within himself to live the sanctified life in holiness and righteousness. Now verse 15. For what I'm doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. Paul is explaining his experience. Being enslaved to sin. Sold under sin. His carnality. He's explaining this experience. And I believe that Paul is describing a period of his Christian life before he came to understand it is only God the Holy Spirit who can free us from sin and our sinful natures. He finally realized there was nothing within himself to be consistently obedient to the law as we see in in 8.2. For the law of the Spirit capital S, spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Very important. Can't wait to get there, too. So he says, for what I am doing, uh, this verb, doing, is uh, the verbal form is the exact, it's the middle or passive the passive voice or the middle voice, each ha- it has the exact same verbal form. You can't look at the verbal form and say, that is middle voice or that is passive voice. So the context has to determine uh, whether it's passive. And all I'm going to say this morning is, if it's passive, he says, for what I'm doing... If it's passive, then he is being acted upon. It points out that when I give a green light to fleshly desires that are emanating from my sinful nature, my thoughts and all my behaviors are going to be dictated by my sinful nature, by my flesh. Isn't that scary? If that's a passive voice, that's what it's saying. For what I am doing, what he's doing is, if it's passive voice, he is receiving this. But first, he gave a green light to it. First, he had a a fleshly thought or desire. And what did he do? Did he dismiss it or did he entertain it? At that point, if you entertain it, then you're going to be dictated to. It's going to take you somewhere that you may not want to go. That's what Paul was saying. I do the very thing I hate. I place myself under the dominion of my fleshly desires, which then gives birth to sin. And in verse 15, Paul says, I do not understand. 
And so we could say, without an understanding of true spirituality, which Steve taught over 100 lessons on, I believe, true spirituality, without an understanding of true spirituality and the graces of Christ, our identification with his death and his resurrection, if we don't understand these things, then we will be the one saying, I don't understand. Why am I doing this? Why do I keep repeating the same sin patterns? Why can't I be free of this? I don't like it. Because I don't understand. We don't like it, but there's generally something else we don't like. We don't like to sit and listen to a teacher teach for an hour. We don't like to focus on God's word. We don't like to engage mentally to a serious level. And so we may be the ones crying out, I just don't get it. If, you, if you've grown cold and apathetic to the word of God, then you better get on your knees because it's going to get worse before it gets better. Because once you grow dull of hearing God's word, then you're going backwards. And that's not a good place to be in. And sometimes it's a long road ahead to get even back where you were. May Paul's experience minister to us. Without an understanding of true spirituality and graces of Christ, we don't understand what's going on. We try so hard, but yet fail so miserably in the Christian life. This is why Romans 6 through 8, 6, 7, and 8 are so vitally important and essential in the Christian way of life. When we live under law, we are operating from our flesh. And when we realize uh, Romans 6, 14, that sin shall not have dominion over you because you are not under law, but you are under God's grace. So sin, when we're under God's grace, sin is not going to have dominion over us. But when we place ourselves under law, when we try to do it apart from God, then we end up under the dominion of sin. We live by the grace of God in the graces of Christ and then we can praise him saying, look what God has done in my life. We don't puff our chests up. We say, look what God all by his grace has done for me. This is the truth that will set you free from the struggle with sin. Now, Paul says for the second sentence in verse 15, for what I will to do that I do not practice, but what I hate that I do. For what I will, what I want, what I desire to do, what I determine to do, that I don't do. I don't care how self-disciplined you are, you are no match for your flesh and sinful nature. You could be the most disciplined person on this planet, but there's just some things you have to accept that you can't do and I can't do and the Apostle Paul couldn't do either. That's why we have to wholly lean upon the grace of God 
in what Christ has provided, what God has provided for us through his Son. We see then that we are carnal, fleshly. We present ourselves to sin and then we become the slave of sin and live in a manner that we hate. It's a miserable existence. And I say very briefly here, we are so rich in our position and yet so oft our experience, in our experience we are so poor. We're like sons of the king, but we're living like paupers. Spiritually speaking. Now verse 16. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. Paul's desire was to obey God's law, his commands. Therefore, he agrees with the law that it's good. But, even though he desires to obey, he does what he desires not to do. He disobeys God. This is, <clears throat> this obviously would be a helpless I say even a very frightening place to be at. Oh, how we need God's grace every day. We have to fall upon him tomorrow just like we fell upon him today. We cannot go into tomorrow if we've had a great day spiritually today. We can't go into Monday that today's victory, as it were, is not going to carry us through Monday. Every day we have to fall upon the grace of God and we have to understand that in my flesh nothing good dwells. Verse 17, Paul is going to draw a conclusion here. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Now, young people... Don't take this verse and fly with it. When your mother or father say something to you about something you've done, <clears throat> it wasn't me. <clears throat> it was the sin that's in me. I don't think they're going to buy that. Uh, so let's come to understand uh, exactly what uh, Paul is saying here. Paul, first of all, Paul is making a distinction between who he is in Christ versus who he is in his carnality sold under sin, as he's just shared with us. He's making a distinction between his position in Christ, which is absolutely perfect, and his experience. <clears throat> Paul is stating what happens when he lives by his flesh and attempts to keep the law all by himself and attempts to live that sanctified life by himself. In Christ, you and I are new creatures and we can walk being alive to God, praise him because of what Christ did for us. But we can also choose to yield to the old man versus the new man. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 3. We'll read just verses 9 and 10 to see the old man new man. And here in Colossians, and we're going to look at something else in Ephesians, here in Colossians, Paul is referring to our position, not our experience. He says in verse 9 of Colossians 3, do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man 
with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. So Paul is talking about our position. In your position, if you're a child of God, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your savior right now, you have put off the old man and the, the moment you accepted Christ as your savior and you put on the new man. That's who you are in your position. Now let's go to Ephesians chapter four. Here, Paul is talking about his experience. Ephesians chapter four, we'll start in verse uh, 20. But what he said in 17 through 19 is this. He's talking to believers. Stop living like an unbeliever. Stop living like you put on the old man. But you have not. By the way, what is the old man? Look at, look at the middle of verse 19. You've given yourselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. That's the former conduct of the old man. And he's saying, stop living like that. But you, verse 20, have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off experientially you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. What a contrast. Lewdness and ungodliness versus righteousness and holiness. And as believers, we can go down either path. I want you to note Verse 22, put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. We'll look at a slide in a minute, I think, if we can go that far, where these, these deceitful, lustful desires rise out of our sinful nature. They pop into our minds, and then we either dismiss it or entertain it. And when we entertain it, then the old man grows corrupt according to these lusts. But if we dismiss it, then we have decided to put on the new man, which was created by God, according to true righteousness and holiness. And that becomes the outcome of our life when we put on the new man or we just keep the new man on all of the time or most of the time as we grow. When we read these verses, well, another example of what we just read about position versus experience, we're not gonna take the time to look it up, but you'll see in Galatians 3.27, it speaks of our position. And then in Romans 3.14, it speaks of our experience. And daily, I emphasize the word daily. And daily, we must apply the truth of our position to our experience here on earth. 
in Christ, I am dead to sin and I'm alive to God. I want to take that position and those truths and all of that grace and I want to apply it in my experience today. When that, when that uh, sinful thought pops into your mind, you take those grace truths and apply them and say, oh no, my old self was crucified with Christ, Romans 6, 6. My old man is dead, positionally. And no, no fleshly lust is going to wake him up that I go back to my former conduct. That's how you have to think. That's the truth you have to begin to apply. When those thoughts pop into your mind, because they will pop into your mind, You realize something? I don't want to discourage anyone. But when you reach 88 years old, 98 years old, your sinful nature is just as bad as it was when you were 18. We better grasp these truths, eh? We better. Because this battle is not, doesn't get easier as you get older if you don't take hold of the grace of God in Jesus Christ. But it does get easier in the sense that when your mind is occupied with Jesus Christ and these fleshly thoughts pop into your mind, you just say no. Your relationship can be so close with Christ, you're married to Christ, dead to the law, married to Christ, and now I think of being faithful to Christ rather than cheating on him. And your occupation with Christ as it grows in your heart and your love for him, your reverence for him, your fear for him grows, then it's easier to say no. It's easier to dismiss that thought. But if you don't have that, understanding you're going to be like the Apostle Paul and all of your life it's going to be a struggle with the dominion of sin that wants to have control of you and dictate your life I will end with three quotes so every minute of every day we are going to be living either according to the old man or the new man. Which do you want? I'm sure every one of us would say, I want the new man. Like Paul says, I want to obey God, but I don't understand why I'm not. This is why we need this truth. The old man, George Zeller, a pastor, associate pastor in Middletown Bible Church says, the old man is my old life in Adam. The new man is my new life in Christ. The one refers to the self-life, the other to the Christ life. The one has to do with fallen man, the other has to do with redeemed or regenerated man. The old man is characterized by that fallen sinful nature received from Adam. The new man characterized by that divine holy nature received from God at the time of the new birth. The old man is born of the flesh. The new man is born of God. The old man came about by natural birth. The new man came about by the new birth, end of quote. Roy Hubner says, the old man is not simply the old nature, though it involves the old sinful nature. The old man is characterized as having a nature that is opposed to God, and this nature stamps its character on the activities of the old man. End of quote. I would have probably worded that a little differently, but you get the idea. 
And next week we're gonna talk about old man versus sinful nature briefly. And lastly, George Zeller again, it is not our place to crucify the old man. Christ has already done that. And believers who try to conquer the old man never win, end of quote. That's a very important quote because in and of our pride and our flesh, what do we wanna do? We, we, we just want the gratifying experience of conquering ourselves. Good luck with that. I don't believe in luck, but uh, don't try that. So I can't express how important these things are. It's, it's so vitally important. It's really the difference. If you grasp these truths and apply them in your life, you will end possibly being under the dominion of sin in your life. It's a terrible place to be. And I'm sure sometimes you get sick of yourself. I can say that, I've been there. And we don't need to be there. God doesn't want us there. Take these truths and I encourage you if you, if you wonder, if you don't have a systematic Bible reading program, then start in Romans 6 and read Romans 6, 7, and 8. And when you get done with chapter 8, go back to 6 and read it again. And keep reading it. And it's not the amount that you read per day. It's the amount you absorb and meditate on. Let's pray. Father, we humbly bow our heads before you and realizing that in our salvation we were helplessly and hopelessly lost and we looked to you and we looked to your provision for our debt of sin and our forgiveness. You, we looked to Jesus Christ, your son. And now sometimes, Father, we confess, we think now that we can do this Christian life. I've got it. And we set ourselves up for defeat because we, for whatever reasons, we don't want to embrace the grace that is afforded us through Jesus Christ in his death on Calvary's cross, that we and his resurrection, that we can be dead to sin like as he died to sin, so we died to sin. And as he rose from the dead, we too rose from spiritual death, being alive to you. Praise you, Father, for what we have in Jesus Christ. It is so rich. And yet, sometimes in our experience, we are so poor. Help us to grasp and understand through the ministry of your Spirit Help us to purpose in our hearts that yes, I will read these chapters and yes, I want to gain this understanding and I want my life to honor and glorify you. So Father, in all of these things, I'm sure we all desire. So Father, help us in this, this week. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.